We are one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Come worship the living God, who is over all, through all and in all. From tender years to maturity, we come to worship you, O oh God. Amen. I just welcome you, brothers and sisters, in the Lord, that you, you would enjoy the word of God, right from the prayers, through the reading of the word of God, and through the sharing of the scriptures. In everything, we want you to enjoy the word of God. May God help you. May God help your mind. May God open your hearts as well, so that when you make a reflection upon the word of God, it has got some meaningful teachings, some meaningful aspects that you consider will help your life. Thank you. God bless you. Let us pray. Might God and most holy God, give of all gifts. We come before you today as members of your body. We are joined in praise. We are joined in pray prayers as we learn from you and share with each other. Build us up, Lord. We pray as we drink in the wonders of your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God that comes from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Uh, let us listen very careful while he is doing the reading. God bless you. Good morning and praise God for today. It's uh, my honor to be able to come and read the Word of God again for you. Uh, I just get so excited reading the word. It's just so full of life and uh, wisdom and strength. And I encourage you to get get excited about Jesus' word and the word of God. As, uh, as Johnson mentioned, Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, it says here, the unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he, ascend mean, uh, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who des descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we, reach, until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forward by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love and each part does its work. Dang, that's awesome. And this is the uh, word of the Lord for this week. Uh, powerful scripture. We can't wait to hear what Johnson's got to say. We'll get him back. Thanks, Reverend. I'm here again. Uh, to, today I've decided to share with you on a theme Congratulations, you've got a job. Congratulations, you've got a job. 
Now, part of our mission is to make disciples of all people, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Now, making disciples leads to maturity, and equipping the saints leads to ministry. Our job is to bring people to the master. But when we bring people to the master, our job is not finished. It is just beginning. Because when we are to bring them to maturity and also to ministry, that job description comes right out of the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us that our job is not just to help sinners become saints, but to lead saints to become servants. From the moment a person becomes a Christian, it becomes our responsibility to help that Christian finish what he starts. And to finish well, this passage tells us how that happens. Paul calls himself, in verse 1, the prisoner of the Lord. Now, the Greek word for prisoner literally means one who is bound. A Christian is someone who is bound to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wrote this while he was in, in a Roman prison. But the truth is, as a Christian, you are a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you are in jail or not, you are a prisoner of Christ. One mark of a prisoner is he has no will of his own. A prisoner goes where he's told to go. A prisoner does what he's told to do. A prisoner eats when he's told to eat, sleeps when he's told to sleep. He lives in a 24-hour state of absolute surrender. Likewise, as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no will of your own. You are will to willing, gladly, voluntarily to do what he wants you to do. Go where he wants you to go. But be what he wants you to be. So now there's one major difference in being a prisoner of the Lord. If you are a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, you never want to escape for it is only then that you are truly free by serving him. So God has chosen us to be Christ's representatives on earth. In light of this truth, we should live worth of the calling we have received. The privilege of being selected as Christ's very own. So this includes being humble, being gentle, being patient, understanding and peaceful. Those characteristics depict a Christian, who you are. People are watching your life. Can they see Christ in you? How well are you doing as this representative here on earth? Because people will not see Christ walking. They will see you walking who represents Christ. So you are the typical image of Jesus Christ here on earth. Now another metaphor Paul uses to describe the master of the Savior is found in verse 15 and 16. Where Christ is called, called the head and the church called the body. Now the body never wants to be free of the head. For without the head, the body dies. The head is over the body to guide it. And the body is under the head to do what the head tells the body to do. That is what it is. We have been saved that we might save. So, the hanging tree was a classic Gary Cooper western film. In that film, a young man had been shot and he was dying. Cooper takes out a knife, digs into this young man and pulls out the bullet, stops the bleeding and bandages him up and nurses the young man back to life. Later on, after he had recovered from his wound, he looked at Gary Cooper and said, Sir, for what you have done to me, what should I do for you? Gary Cooper in the movie says, you are going to be my servant for the rest of your life because that is how long you would have been dead if I had not saved you. May I tell you that the height of your maturity in Christ can be measured by the depth of your surrender to Christ. Christianity begins with the master of the Savior. You are under the master of the Savior. Christianity blossoms in the ministry of the same. Paul goes on to say in verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. When you become a Christian, you not only get the Savior, you get the Spirit, and the Spirit gives you a spiritual gift. 
So the Greek word for grace, charis, gives us the word charisma or charismatic, which literally means gift. Every Christian is gifted. He is a gifted child of God. Just as you have been saved by grace, you are to save others by grace. You have been given a spiritual gift. Your gift is not to be left wrapped under the tree of grace. It is to be unwrapped and used in the service of the king. So you are gifted. You have a responsibility to discover your spiritual gift, develop your spiritual gift, and deploy your spiritual gift for the glory of God and the good of the church. Maybe you don't know your gift. Ask others who have been with you in the church and say, what am I gifted in? They will maybe help you to understand that you've got a gift. There is no Christian who doesn't have a gift. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4 verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold of God's grace. Congratulations, you've got a job. That's what I mean. You've got a job. Every Christian has got a job. Get this next statement down plain and take it into the bulletin board of your mind. <clears throat> or take it into the software of your mind. God wants you, every member, to become a minister. One of the most misunderstood words in English language is the word minister. People now use it as a synonym for someone who is formally ordained or a seminary trained or in the full-time gospel ministry. Don't make that mistake with the word minister. Did you know that the word minister comes from the Latin word servant? Or attended is based on the root word minus, which means less. Technically, a minister is someone of lesser rank. Or a status, someone whose job is to save and not to be saved. So all those who are called ministers are servants of the Lord. They are there to save and not to be saved. So I'm afraid that a lot of Christians think of ordained ministers as God's first team, doing the work while everybody else is on the cheering lead. Everyone is being spectators. No. The fact is we are all to be out there on the field playing the game. No Christian is a spectator. Every Christian should be doing something. As a matter of fact, that is why God has given me to you. Paul says in verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. In Ephesians 2 verse 20. And tells us that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That is, they laid the foundation doctrinal and theologically upon which the church has been built. So their job is to reveal the Savior to sinners. They are given to guide the church in the way it should go and to guard the church in what it ought to be and what it ought to know. So then God gave evangelists. An evangelist is one who preaches the gospel with the special gift of reaching the lost. Now, when the apostles and the prophets reveal the Savior to the sinner, the evangelist turns the sinner into a saint. But then God gave the pastors and the teachers. So in the Greek text, those are combined into one position, pastor and teacher. His job is to turn saints into servants. You see, my job is not only to teach you the message of the gospel. It is also to train you for the ministry of the gospel. I have an equipping ministry. So, whatever message I am preaching is equipping you. So the reason why God has given pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, the word, in verse 12, the word equipping is a medical term which referred to the setting of a broken bone. It literally means to make complete. My work in the church is to get you to do the work of the church. It is my job to enlist you, to equip you, to enable you, to energize you to do the work of the ministry so that the work of God doesn't fail. Rick Warren has said that the greatest need in the evangelical church is the release of members for ministry. It has been discovered that only 10% of church members are active in any kind of personal ministry. 
And that 50% of all church members have no interest in serving any ministry. You see, not only is it necessary for the survival of the church for members to become ministers, but also for the survival of the pastor. I, I think I know why a lot of pastors are on the verge of burnout. And why multiplied hundreds leave the ministry every year? A lot of pastors are leaving the ministry every year. Why? Just as I have an equipping ministry, you have an edifying ministry. For the purpose of members becoming ministers, for the edifying of the body of Christ, in verse 12, we need to be doing the work together. It's not for the pastor to do everything while his others are spectators. I thank God for those people that serve this church. But that number one is going to have to multiply greatly if this church is going to go forward and upward for the glory of God. Did you know that more, when that church is growing more, the ratio of workers who are needed to continue the ministry of that church grows even greater. The responsibility grows greater. So the word edifying in verse 12 is a word that literally means to build a house. That's why you say those who do that, they edify the church, they build the church. Spiritual gifts are not toys to play with. They are not tools. They are tools to build them with. When a believer does not put his gift to work, the body suffers. And that is the body of Christ. For God gives each person uniquely and individually to do the work that he has called him to do. And when the gift is not exercised, that work is not done. So there are people with gifts which have never been used in the church. They've got these gifts. Not that they are passionate about, but they've got gifts which are suffering from disuse. They have never been used. And we are saying people should be using these gifts. Jesus not only wants the church to grow outward and inward, he wants the church to grow upward. Mastering means to lead to maturity. You see, the goal in all of this is that every Christian become, according to verse 13, a perfect man. The word perfect means complete, mature. Someone who knows what they are doing. Someone who knows that they are serving a master. Warren Wesby, one of the greatest Bible teachers, once said, after over a quarter century of ministry, I'm convinced that spiritual immaturity is the number one problem in our churches. We have got a lot of people who are immature in our churches. If I want to put it that way. There are too many Christians in our churches today who never grow up, they just grow old. They are not growing up. They just grow old. We have got too many adult babies in our churches who are wearing spiritual diapers. Vance Havens once said, if we graded our members according to their spiritual development, most of our church would be in the nursery. Not where we are supposed to be. Maturity is absolutely necessary to a health church because of what it does for the church. If we have got people who are mature, you would see by what they do in the church. It tells you that the church is what mature people. So maturity provides unity within the body. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stage of the fullness of Christ, in verse 18. You see, the more we grow in Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. The more we read the Bible, the more we become like Jesus. The more we become like Jesus, the closer we get to Jesus. The closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to each other. It leads to maturity. It's only maturity. Maturity also provides stability of the body. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men. In the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. These days a lot of people survive on YouTube messages. Some of it, I would say, is not good doctrine. It doesn't ground, its, it's foundation is not from the Bible. Any teaching that has no foundation from the Bible, please don't take it. You are supposed to know that this is incorrect doctrine. Because it's not emanating from the word of God. Now children will believe just about anything. 
That's why it is saying that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro with every, with every wind of doctrine, which means anything that comes your way, you just take. You are able to have the spirit of discernment, of seeing that, no, 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 this is not it. This is not it. But a mature adult believer will believe that the right things he has learned to tell the truth from error. The way you are able to tell the truth from error is to know the truth. How do you know the truth? Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You see, you grow spiritually the same way you grow physically. How do you grow physically? By food, rest, exercise. How do you grow spiritually? When you rest in the Lord, exercise of your holiness and feed on the word of God. You need to feed on the word of God. Your Bible provides exactly the diet you need to become a mature Christian. In Matthew 4 verse 4 tells us that the word of God, God's word is bread. In 1 Peter 2 verse 2 tells us that God's word is milk. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2 tells us that God's word is solid food. In Psalms 119 verse 103 tells us God's word is honey. What a menu from which to grow. What a menu from which to survive. I think I know why most Christians are not growing. They are like men that walked in the doctor's office with a cucumber up in his nose and a carrot in his left ear and a banana in his right ear. And he said, doctor, what is wrong with me? The doctor said, simple, you are not eating right. That's what we are doing. Well, if you will feed on the word of God, you won't be like a leaf on a tree blown by the wind or a cocoa in the ocean tossed by the waves. You will be like a rock in the ground that cannot be moved. You will not be moved because you live by the word of God. What does the word of God say? You are always asking yourself, what does the word of God say? So maturity preserves integrity in the body. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things, in him, into him, who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body by the edifying of itself in love. Verses 15 and 16. Now we see how ministry and maturity are linked together. You can see now, ministry and maturity is linked together. When every member is a minister, when everybody is doing his share and pulling his load, when every member in the body is in tune with the head, then the entire body functions properly. The good news is whether you are a member of this church or not, whether you are, whether you are listening from my message from far away from me, you get involved in some aspect of the work of this church. You get involved in some aspect of the work of the church, wherever you are. So do something in the service of the church if you would like. Start from now to say, what can I do to the service of the church? Every Christian has been called to minister. Every Christian has been called to ministry. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, that every Christian is called to be a pastor or called to work full-time in a church. But at the same time, every Christian is called to full-time Christian service. Listen to the scriptures in Romans 7 verse 4. Now you belong to him in order that we might be useful in the service of God. We need to be useful in the service of God. Every Christian is to serve the Lord full time. In God's ministry, there are no part-timers, no half days or holidays, no 8, to 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. rules, or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. rules. You can't go on strike. There is no retirement in serving God. You save God till you die. You were saved to save. You were not saved to sit sour and sour. Think about this. Why doesn't God take you to heaven the moment you are saved? Why doesn't God take you to heaven? There can only be one explanation. He has a ministry for you to do. Congratulations. You now have got a job. Congratulations. You have got a job today. I'm offering you that job through the reading of the word of God. What does God want you to do in a church? Because he wants you to minister in a church. 
Why does God bring need people to you during this week? So that you can minister outside the church. Does you, do you know that God is looking for? What God is looking for in a church? God is looking for servants. Would you say today in your own heart, Here I am at your service, Lord. I want to save you, Lord. I want to save you, only you. I don't want to save anyone. I want to save you, Lord. Would you say that today? As I've said to you, congratulations. You have got a job. You've got a job. I know maybe you're saying, oh, how can I have a job? I'm in COVID season, COVID period. Nothing is happening. I'm saying congratulations. You've got a job. During this COVID time, you've got a job. God is helping you so that you can become what you are asking to become. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you. We adore you. We love you. We, we thank you for everything that you've done to us. We have now realized that you are God. We thank you, God, that you have brought us safely here. We pause to think of the gaps in our congregation. We pause to think of those who might no longer be coming. We pause to think those who have been affected by COVID-19. We pause to think those who have lost their faith. Those who, for many reasons, may not be with us. They are still our family members. As we come to you, we bring them, Lord Jesus. Bind us together in your love and in the sharing of your gifts. That every person knows that they've got a job to do. That every person knows that they've got a ministry to carry. Father, we thank you. Lord God, your world is full of beautiful gifts. But sometimes we just do not see. Sometimes we take our gifts for granted. See them as our own property. And we boost about them. And when we should be using them for the benefit of others. Sometimes we know you are calling us to use your gift. But we hold back and someone suffers. Sometimes we use our gift when we should be giving someone else the chance to use theirs. We are sorry, Lord. Help us not to be proud to step back. Amen, and amen, and amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I just want to remind you that after hearing the word of God, we are obliged also to thank God. So it's time for us to give our offering, which I would also refer as thanksgiving offering. You are thanking God for what God has done to you. Think about the things that you have encountered. Some of you, you are really, you need to be very, really thankful to God because you have not encountered what others are encountering during this COVID period. Others are encountering really challenges, but maybe you've never even encountered any of those, so you need to thank God. If you have been spared during this COVID-19, you need to thank God. If you are able to listen to my message, you need to thank God. May the good Lord help you as you now take your time to give your thanksgiving. Let us pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we bring our thanksgiving before you. Father, we thank you that this is an offering that is only meant for you. May you bless it, Father, so that it can be used for your kingdom. Bless every member Bless all those who are making these contributions right now. Those who are willingly not being forced, not being coerced, but who are willingly want to say thank you, Lord. Let them be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.
from now and evermore. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, thank you for taking your time to listen to the message of God. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.